what kinds of therapies you administer in your practice and what you use them for. I look at a person's condition if they have any of the issues that stem cells can address, then I can help them. The intravenous route does address a lot of problems all at once, including recruiting their immune system to help them fight the battle. One of the most astounding cases will be the gentleman with liver cirrhosis. His brother knew that he was dying from liver cirrhosis. He didn't qualify for liver transplant. He was already in hospice. I gave him one uh, treatment and I was expecting him to come back for the second and he never came back. He went back to his doctor, of course, rechecks liver function and it was actually normal. Hello, I'm here with the privilege of sitting with Dr. Joy Kong for another episode of this incredible space, this universe of regenerative medicine and stem cell therapies. And we're here joining you today to discover more about this in-depth science and field that is emerging and growing so rapidly in our world today. So thank you for being here today, Dr. Joy. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for, for hosting this. Yes, thank you. It's my pleasure. Okay, so let's get right into it. We'd like to know from you, in simple terms, what are stem cells and what do they do? Uh, stem cells are really, when you think about what made us, we all came from a single stem cell. So that's the quintessential stem cell. That That is the, you know, the mother of all. Um, the organism as it grows right from a single stem cell it, it becomes many many more stem cells but then they all start to differentiate to gain more function so they they gain certain abilities but then they also lose certain you know broader ability to differentiate so as they go down the tree um they they can gain function but lose potentials um so all those are stem cells so if you look at stem cells uh, all the way from embryonic stem cell or from the very first uh, fertilized egg, all the way down to embryonic stem cell, really is day five to seven um, of the embryo, the inner cell mass, that's where you can take one of the cells um, and you can grow a full, full human. Um, but as the cells keep dividing and dividing and form a, a full human within each organ, there are the downstream, the lowest level of stem cell. Those are tissue specific stem cells. So let's say in muscle, you have muscle specific stem cells. So these are muscle stem cells that all they can do is to differentiate into a muscle. But if you trace it upward, uh, earlier, you know, ancestor, they can form muscles, fat, bone. So those are more lenient, right? If you go more upward, they can even form more different types of organs. So, so there's this almost seamless tree of different stem cells. So when we talk about stem cells, people think that there's one thing, there's no single thing. It's very complex. So what are we using? So these days, one of the most popular one is mesenchymal stem cells. So they came from a particular lineage and they end up residing in all our tissues. So anywhere where you have blood vessels, um, you will have these cells because what they are doing is that they are hugging the blood vessels and they are sensing what's going on in your blood and what's going, going on in your local tissue. Their work is more like a conductor of uh, in the symphony of regeneration. So they are sensing what your body need and they send signals. They can send signals to your immune organs, to send immune cells to help you repair. They can send signals to local stem cells to tell the local stem cells to divide. So, so these are the stem cells that we currently are using and which is the hottest subject right now. But we still have all kinds of other stem cells in the body, including hematopoietic progenitor cells. Those can differentiate into all kinds of, um, of blood cells. And we have other um, uh, stem cells like endothelial progenitor cells, fibroblasts, um, and of course, in different organ, there are different stem cells. We even have pluripotent stem cells. So these are the cells that can differentiate into anything. So we still have a very minute amount in our body. So it's a very complex uh, system that contains stem cells. Unfortunately, as we age, 
the number of stem cells decline drastically. So there's no way around it. Life itself is consuming. It consumes the, you know, your, your cells, your healthy, you know, the, the original perfect cells start to degrade until later on, you know, our telomeres are shortened. Our DNA start to make mistakes when they replicate and there are all these um, oxidative damages, um, lack of nutrition, lack of signals, lack of enzymes. So we just start to degrade and, and the cells during the process, they can also die and they can also lose the ability to replicate correctly. So you end up with less and less stem cells, just like, um, even if you just look at mesenchymal stem cells, uh, when we were born, every 10,000 cells is a mesenchymal stem cell. When we reach our teenage years, it becomes one in 100,000. And when we reach our 40s, is one in 400,000. And we reach our 80s, one in 2 million. So you can see it's, it's a precipitous decline. Um, so that's kind of a general picture of what stem cells are. But if you want to nail down the textbook definition, uh, these are the cells that can self-replicate. Um, they can replenish themselves right? So they can keep their own supply and they have the ability to differentiate, to gain function, to become more specialized cells. Um, so that's kind of the, the general overview of what stem cells are. Very interesting. And just to reiterate what you were saying, that the quality of these stem cells are very vast. Each has a specific function for either a system or an organ. And as they move from the fetal state through the umbilical cord, it moves into an, an organism and then through to all the organs to become a fully um, fledged human being. Is that correct? Yes. So these stem cells, are they... Do you use do you use fetal cells? Like, are the, is that ethical? Do people use fetal cells? The umbilical cord cells are there living cells in those? There's a lot of controversy around okay. stem cells, and I think a lot of misinformation around kind of you know stem cells from birth tissue as opposed to bone marrow tissue, muscle tissue. Could you elaborate on that? That's a great question because there's so much misconception, and I can't. I, I can't you know, tell you how many times I've repeated myself, but the same myth is persisting. So I'm, you know, I, I'm just going to be tireless. I would just keep repeating myself. So birth tissue stem cells means is tissue that's obtained at birth, right? These are, are the placenta and umbilical cord. That's what's called birth tissue. So the baby is born, the baby's healthy, and you cut the cord and you get the placenta and the umbilical cord, how they were dealt with is, was that they were just tossed in a biological waste basket. But now we know that they're full of incredible, powerful cells. That's when we can extract them and use them. Um, so the word umbilical um, sounds a little similar to embryonic. So a lot of people get these two very confused. The umbilical cord is the cord we all had when, when, once upon a time you know, to the placenta. And, uh, and uh, the embryonic is the embryonic stem cells was way back uh, at day five to seven after conception, after the, the, the eggs were fertilized. So that's all the way back 10 months ago, right? When the baby was, um, well, not the baby yet, it was an embryo. So one cell, you know, started dividing and forming a ball of cells. And day five to seven after fertilization, that's when you can take one of the cells in this ball, inside the ball, and use them as an embryonic stem cell. So that's vastly different. And these cells, yes, they're amazing. They have huge potentials to differentiate, but um, they also are a little wild because they can start to differentiate indiscriminately. So they sometimes, that's why you hear about some women you know, they had pregnancy, but they got, they end up, you know, it kept growing, but it turned out to be a tumor. So, you know, what's causing that? It could be genetic defect, right? A lot of things have to be aligned perfectly for a baby to be a fully grown, healthy baby with all the limbs and all the organs. It, it takes a lot for that to happen. So a lot of times um, cells just go awry, go crazy, and then they form a ball of uncontrolled growth. 
um, you know, it's, it's a scary ball of tissue with all kinds of stuff. You know, you can find teeth in a hair in it. The embryonic stem cells have those potentials to develop into a teratoma, but not the birth tissue cells. So the birth tissue cells have been so far down the line that they have lost that ability to go crazy. So you don't have that potential. Um, some of the cells, you know, neural cells, that's rarely used, but there are what's called induced pluripotent stem cells. That's when, when you can take, let's say, a, a cell from the skin. That's an initial research. They take a cell from the skin and they give them signals to revert them back to the embryonic state. Unfortunately, these cells have the same problem that they can cause teratoma. They can cause these tumor formations. So we, we don't know how to control them yet. Um, but these birth tissue cells uh, don't have that problem. And the birth tissue uh, also is kind of in between embryonic stem cells and the baby's stem cells. So they're not exactly the same age as the baby, which is fascinating. Um, they're actually much younger because when the fetus is forming, uh, the umbilical cord, you know, all the cells are migrating out of the initial ball, right? They're forming this embryo. And during this formation, a lot of the young cells are trapped into the umbilical cord. And, um, and so they're retaining some of the features as embryonic stem cells. So that means they have a wider potential to differentiate. They just have more potential, but they've lost the potential to go crazy. They lost the potential for teratoma. So they're very different. Um, and then you mentioned bone marrow stem cells. And so there's also fat derived stem cells. There are all kinds, you know, you can get stem cells from dental pulp, uh, from menstrual blood. You know, people, you can get it from a lot of places. Um, so when you get it from the same person, it's called autologous stem cells. Those are the cells that those stem cells you're getting are the exact same age, right? And same uh, DNA uh, integrity as, as what your, your age is, you know, depending on your health, your uh, lifestyle, all these things really affect the quality of these cells. If you have diabetes, you're, you are obese, that affect the quality of the cells. Um, and also because they're older, they've lost a lot of potentials to develop into more cells comparing to birth tissue. You know, they, there's research supporting this comparing um, umbilical cord derived stem cells versus fat derived or bone marrow derived stem cells. And to see how, how far their range of differentiations are then the adult stem cells, the, the autologous stem cells definitely have lost a lot of potential. The problem is not only they've lost potential, they've also become more dangerous. So one of the studies that's really fascinating was a direct comparison between umbilical cord derived MSCs, so mesenchymal stem cells, versus fat derived MSCs. And they put these MSCs next to cancer cells because there's some reports of stem cells exacerbating existing cancer. So, so they, they did this study. So they put it next to cancer cells, a very very um, virulent form of uh, brain cancer, glioblastoma. So they put it next to cancer cells, both in a Petri dish and on an animal's body. In both cases, the fat-derived stem cells made the cancer grow, but the umbilical cord-derived stem cells make the cancer shrink and go away. So that's how dras drastically they're different, which is why I, you know, after all the search, um, you know, just on existing research, I just felt that is my obligation to provide people not only the most potent form of therapy, but also the safest. So that's kind of the, uh, you know, the different stem cell type. If people are interested, they should look at my YouTube video, Are All MSCs Created Equal? This is a lecture I've given in various conferences, um, you know, to, to clinicians and um in scientists and just to show people what research has shown, because it seems like people are so set in their own field. You know, I do bone marrow stem cells. I do, you know, umbilical core stem cells, but they're not looking across the field to see really what's the best, what's going on. So when I came onto the field, I just want to give people the best. It doesn't matter which type. I just want to make sure that, that I know what I'm, I'm doing. And then I realized that no one knows about all these research. So I better present it. And that's how it came about. So 
So that's a 40 minute lecture. Our OMIC is created equal. If you're interested in research, you can you know look at all the research I'm citing. It's all about research and all about statistics, um, not not about my opinion. So after this comparison, that's how I came to the conclusion that umbilical cord stem cells, at least for now, is the best form of cells. Um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen five years from now. I'm, you know, I'm following up on the research. So we don't know, but at least right now it's still the best. Um, so, so that's kind of the, um, you know, one of the big myths <laughs> about uh, stem cells, you know, you know, the, um, the, actually I talked about probably a few, you know, people think your own stem cells better. That's one of the myths. Another myth is that, that we're killing babies either by destroying embryos or using fetuses. And uh, I, I don't know anybody using fetus cells in the United States. There are some um, labs, especially Ukraine, they're well known for using fetal cells. You know, what I've, I've learned is that a lot of Russian women would go to these clinics to abort the babies and get paid to abort their babies so they can sell the, the baby, you know, to be used as stem cell donors. And um, the Ukraine clinics are, they were, you know, it's not that sophisticated. They grind up the baby and grind up the fetus and then infuse to people. So that to me is not, you know, the, the kind of scientific way to approach stem cell therapy, you know, to just grind something up. Um, there's a lot of potential problems. You know, when you, you know, have a full baby, there's a lot of adult uh, expression of, you know, fully grown uh, cells with their full surface markers, and that can cause rejection. Um, so you really need to extract real stem cells from them. So, um, yeah, so that's the a couple of the myths that I'm covering. Thank you so much. That's very, very intriguing to hear about that. And I think misinformation is one of the most uh, potent ways of not being able to develop and grow as a, a humanity. So yes, you're right. You need to repeat and keep repeating the truth <laughs> so that the non-truth can start to move to the side where it belongs. Right. I want to know a little bit about what kinds of therapies you administer in your practice and what you use them for. I rely a lot on intravenous therapy because I think there's uh, probably the most evidence um, I do a lot of local joint injections and local tissue injections and including facial rejuvenation, hair restoration, you know, penile, you know, vaginal injections. So I can do all that, but the mainstay is intravenous um, because even for local t issues, and I've treated a lot of local issues through IV injections because the cells have the capability to travel to the place where they, there's a lot of inflammation and injury. And not only that, they do interact with you, your immune system, which is why they're so powerful in autoimmune diseases. And there's so much evidence to treat all sorts of autoimmune diseases because they modulate your immune system. So, um, you know, so th th this, you know, brings us back to how the stem cells work. So the stem cells are highly anti-inflammatory. Um, so aging is actually an inflammatory disease. As we age, we you know, we become more and more inflamed, even though you look healthy, but if you measure your inflammation markers, they're all starting to elevate and, you know, further and further. Um, they're also, uh, the stem cells are modulating for the immune system. So if it's too weak, it will help boost the immune system. If it's overactive, it can calm it down and um, it helps promote um, angiogenesis. That's new blood vessel formation. A lot of tissues uh, lack blood circulation. And that's one reason they're not recovering very well. So when you can enhance blood circulation and deliver oxygen, nutrients, and remove toxic waste, then the healing can really occur. Um, and of course, when you grow new tissues, you also need blood supply. Um, what else do they do? They can rescue damaged tissue. So some damaged tissue may end up dying, but the stem cells has a way to reverse a programmed cell death. Um, so let's say somebody has a crush injury, the area that not, that's not crushed end up dying or st a stroke, the area that didn't get blood supply cut off eventually end up dying. And that's because the cells, um, are receiving certain signals from the cells that are actually really, you know, got their blood supply cut off. 
So those signals end up trigger uh, triggering program cell death. The stem cells can go in there saying, hey, that you don't have to die. You know, why don't we, let me reverse these signals. And they can also trigger these program cell death signals if you they think the cells need to die. Senescent cells, uh, cancer cells, those who don't belong, the stem cells, especially the younger stem cells, have the intelligence to detect and then trigger the cells to go on program cell death. They also have the ability to secrete a lot of signals to local area to recruit immune cells, to tell the local stem cells, you know, you divide, you start replenish the tissue. Not so much the stem cells themselves start dividing. They do sometimes, but majority of the time, especially since we're talking a lot about MICs, wow. mesenchymal stem cells, they tell the local stem cells to divide and repair the tissue. And they also have my, uh, antimicrobial properties. So they can secrete direct antimicrobial peptides. So very interesting. Um, and um, they can elevate cellular energy. You know, one way they do that is by mitochondria transfer, which is really fun. That's when you can observe it on electron microscopy. You can see the mitochondria actually travel across microtubules, you know, from one cell to another. Sometimes they're just shoot out into the space, the mitochondria, and then be taken up by another cells. Sometimes they're they're sent out by a big vesicle. So there are all kinds of different ways the cells can give mitochondria away. Um, so when, you know, of course, if you use your own cells, you just have your same old tired mitochondria, whatever your state of mitochondria is. Of course, as we age, they decline. But if you're using young, uh, very vibrant cells, they have young, fresh mitochondria, then you get a infuse, infusion of new mitochondria and to elevate the energy of your own cells. So these are different ways of work. So looking at how it works, then, you know, I can tailor my therapy, right? Okay, what's your condition? And can the cells help? If your condition, you know, touch upon any of those, oh, I didn't even mention anti-fibrotic anti properties. So it actually helps break down scar tissue. And that's been demonstrated in heart diseases, right? Myocardial infarction, where the heart are fibrosed, or liver cirrhosis, or in COPD. So in all these fibrotic conditions, the cells can break down scar tissue. And I've seen them breaking down scar tissue in, in things like, um, like uh, testicular nodules, right? Things that we don't talk much about that I don't see any research on, but I've seen in my clinical practice, I've seen people with um, uh, thyroid nodules that goes away after a stem cell treatment. When they go back to ultrasound, nobody could find them anymore. So yeah, so these are all really powerful properties. Um, so in my clinic, then I look at a person's condition. If they have any of the issues that the stem cells can address, then I can help them. The intravenous route does address a lot of problems all at once, including recruiting their immune system to help them fight the battle. And we all know the immune system is highly intelligent and sophisticated. Um, so to be able to talk to your spleen and talk to all your peripheral lymphoid system and get them on board to help you repair. And that's when it's really powerful. And I've seen that in my patients. I've seen that in myself. I've injured my own foot. You know, I really very dumb jumping off, you know, a very tall rock, landing on a little rock, breaking my calcaneus. I inject cells into my heel. Uh, it helps some. I did everything else. It helps some. But it's not until I did an IV infusion on myself that things sped up drastically. You know, it, it, it was um, two to three times as fast as far as healing. So when you can recruit your whole body to help you, that's when, when things really, really change. It's interesting. It's, it's almost like you're giving fuel to the car. And then in another regard, it's like an ad adaptogenic ingredient that's going in there and recognize. So it's not like localizing the therapeutics for where the onsite of imbalance or intrusion is it's it's allowing the intelligence of the of the stem cells to go in and then do their own job which is really fascinating right. so i'd like to ask you when you are dealing with um somebody that ha is contending with an injury or an imbalance or something that they need to take care of I know for each person, it must be very different how many times they need to get seen by you. But 
generally, like, do they have to be seen for two years, three years? Is it one time? Does it vary patient to patient? How do you administer it? How do you monitor it? And what are the results you've seen for people to sort of recover from uh, their challenges? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually made a video kind of on that subject. It's called Three Stages Healing uh, with Stem Cell Therapy. So um, how people respond, of course, depending on what we're treating and how severe they are. So if it's a chronic condition, um, a severe condition that's you know going on for quite a while, um, you know, I, I I always say, you know, let's plan to expect about three sessions for the first phase of treatment to push you your repair to to the final you know the, the final uh, destination. Um, have I seen miracles where one treatment caused drastic you know improvement? Then a person is like, I'm doing great. I and then I'll be like, wonderful. I can't be happier. So don't come back then. You know, like I'm so happy and it saved you money and, and you know like I feel like a hero. So that's fantastic. Um, I've seen that even in horrible cases, right? People are in their deathbed and I've seen reversal of their conditions, but do I expect that to happen when people come into my door? No, I I'm not expecting miracles. I'm providing a medical treatment. Sometimes things can happen, but a lot of times it, it doesn't, um, like with most medical treatment. Um, so, and I tell people it's kind of like taking antibiotics, right? Um, you, you got an infection. Do you want to take the whole bottle of antibiotics all at once thinking, Hey, I'm done. You know, I know this antibiotics works, so I'm just going to give my body a whole lot of antibiotics and then I'll be cured. No, you don't do that. You take one every four to six hours, right. Or every, you know, twice a day, um, because your system needs time. You needs, it, it, there's a biological rhythm that we're dealing with. You don't just give one thing you know, a whole lot of it, expecting everything just, you know, gets fixed. You want to respect the biological, you know, rhythm. So I think the best way is to provide one wave of treatment. And because the rationale is the cells live in your body for about one to three months and their effect, uh, even after they've died, will last for another three months because they, they produce different uh, exosomes, different growth factors. So they will continue to exert their benefit for another three months. So, so once the cells are out of your body and then you can give another wave of cells to keep, keep it working. That's why I say, you know, let's do a treatment every one to two months. Um, let's keep pushing. You, of course, we depend on how you're doing. If you're getting a great relief and then things are, you know, kind of going backward in one month. Okay. Let's do in one month or if three weeks, okay, let's do a little earlier. If you're doing really wonderful, you're still seeing improvement, improvement in two months down the road. Okay, then let's do the next one in two months. So, you, you know, it's individual based. Um, I don't like dogmas. I think everyone is very different. So you want to respect that. And um, so after the three sessions, maybe somebody will need more, will need four sessions. You know, maybe you know, our condition is really difficult to reverse. And once they get to a good place or as good of a place as is possible, because, you know, I'll be honest, stem cells is not going to cure everything. Um, it will help a lot of conditions, you know, research have shown that, but some conditions are harder to treat than others. Neurological conditions, uh, neurodegenerative issues are probably the most notorious for harder to treat and traditional medicine has almost nothing to offer. Unfortunately, that's why I did not go into, go into neurology, even though I did neuroscience research, you know, when I was um, finished college, I love the brain. I love, you know, neurological system, but I thought this is too depressing of a specialty to go into because there's no way that you, you're actually improving these people's health. So, um, but stem cells has the potential, um, but neurological conditions are harder to treat and, and they take longer time to recover more than other things like autoimmune diseases. So once we get people to the best place we can, then it's a matter of maintenance. If they're doing great, they're, they fix their diet, they've addressed their microbiome, they are taking the right supplements, they give their body what it needs, then maybe, maybe they don't need another one. Um, except that we're all aging, right? That's not something we can escape. 
we're all declining one way or another, eventually to a final, final place. Um, so do you want to live better or age better? Do you want to have less potential for diseases, um, less chance for dying um, or live more usefully? So if that's your goal, you know, after you've addressed your disease, then you can do an anti-aging treatment every three to six months. So that's the general recommendation. You know, I told you how long the cells live and their effect. That's why there's this recommendation of every three to six months. Um, research on animals have been pretty consistent looking at stem cells benefits in longevity. And it consistently extends uh, animals' lifespan by about 30% when you give regular stem cell treatments, you know, these are IV infusions. So, so if you want that benefit, then you do it every three to six months. And I do it every three months. I, you know, and I have patients who want to do it every two months, you know, it's up to the person. I, I don't think even, even I went one, one month is that excessive, you know, you can do that. Um, it gets costly, but you can definitely do that. So, so that's kind of the, the frequency that I would recommend and what people can expect because the cells can go into your body and produce long-term benefits. Um, you know, it can, it can last for a long time, the rejuvenative properties, but, um, yeah, but if you, if so I basically, I tell people, please do everything I'm recommending, please optimize your nutrition, please exercise, please, you know, don't put any more toxins in your body, you know, try to detoxify and optimize your gut, optimize your hormones. If you do all this, you are safeguarding your investment in the stem cells. Then you don't have to come see me as often. So I try to get people to do, you know, do, do the best things for themselves. But, you know, a lot of people are set in their ways. They would rather keep doing what they're doing and just come back in more frequently. So <laughs> everyone has their own uh, way of doing things. Well, I think it's I think it's interesting how we're living in a time now where people I think more cognizant to their lifestyle, especially post COVID. I think more and more people are now aware that they just can't take a pill to take care of a problem. They can't just do one thing. So the lifestyle of your therapies and your therapeutics is such an integral part of everything that you do and makes such complete sense. I'd like to ask you about joint degeneration and how you approach this uh, in your therapies, because that's that's kind of a big area where people have joint injuries and joint degeneration. And I know that there's a lot of conversation around stem cells and this kind of repair. Yeah, so joint degeneration is really, when you are over the age 50 or so, um, <clears throat> a lot of the joint degeneration, I mean, it's not so much sports injury anymore. Um, it's not an acute injury. So when you are acutely injuring, but sometimes even 30 year old, you know, 40 year old, they injure themselves. Why is it not healing? Well, it's because your body's regenerative potential has been lagging. Maybe you haven't been taking as good care of yourself. Maybe your body has a base level inflammation. You know, your body just can't mount repair as effectively. Um, so when it comes to joint dege degeneration, like osteoarthritis, that's definitely an inflammatory disease. And the inflammation is just not, it's not just in your joint, it's everywhere in your body. It's, it's a reflection of your whole body. So in those cases, I want to address what's going on in the whole body and what's going on in the joint, especially when it's a large joint, because when the joint is very large, the uh, whatever I put in the blood has very slow uh, rate of exchange with the synovial fluid that um, bathes the the joint, the the cartilage. So in those cases, I may need to inject directly into the joint space because the exchange rate is so slow; it may take two months for whatever I put in the blood to get into the joint space. So that's when I attack from both angles, especially when you think about the outer one third of the cartilage is nourished by the blood supply; the inner two thirds is nourished by the synovial fluid. So when you can attack from both ends, then you get much more complete healing. Um, and not to mention when you are able to utilize the, this, you know, the approach of an IV that does interact with your immune system. And like I said, it does calm down your inflammation throughout your body and bring up your regenerative potential. It will 
you know, talk to your immune system. So immune system will come on board to help you heal. And that's all very crucial. You know, they've demonstrated in various conditions, you know, through IV treatment um, to target local issues. And I've seen that a lot. So um, yeah, so for joints, that's my thing that I want to address from both angles. Unless a person's very young and we know the person just, you know, hurt themselves. Okay. Let's put some more cells locally. That's okay. But majority of the patients who come to me has had the problem chronically. It's just not healing. And I think adding the systemic approach is very helpful. Interesting. Could you tell us a bit about uh, your successes with any of the cases you've had that are inspiring? One of the most astounding case will be the gentleman with liver cirrhosis. And, um, and that's the one I thought was those one of those hallelujah miracles um, because I gave him one uh, treatment and I was expecting him to come back for the second and he never came back. Um, he was already in hospice and his brother knew that he was dying from liver cirrhosis. He didn't qualify for liver transplant. But um, um, so the brother wanted to, you know, basically pay for his treatment and give a last ditch effort to see if he could save his life. So I gave him one treatment. He was extremely thin with uh, ascites, you know, very swollen belly and um, barely had energy to talk. Um, and I give him one treatment and on their drive back home, because they had to drive about five, six hours on their drive back home midway, the brother said that the swelling had gone down a significant degree. And within a few weeks, the brother said, that he was walking around in the yard, talking on the phone, you know, with a normal voice, you know, walking around, you know, back and forth like a normal person. And then within a few months, I think it was, you know, two to three months, um, he went back to his doctor, of course, rechecks the liver function, and it was actually normal. So that one was astounding. And I really did not expect, um, you know, that kind of <laughs> results. And I've treated, you know, chronic, you know, difficult conditions that Western medicine really has m- not much to offer, like COPD, right? The 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 chronic uh, lung, you know, fibrotic condition. Um, people are on oxygen, so I've treated quite a few gentlemen uh, and 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 you know, ladies uh, with this condition. And um, you know, in one case, this um, this gentleman had uh, was on oxygen on a ton of COPD medications, and after the treatment. I gave him two treatments and after the treatments, he was able to get off oxygen and got off almost all of his COPD medications. And instead of being, you know, stuck at home with an oxygen tank, he went out and played in the band with his friends and also similar things with um, cardiac problems, people with history of heart failure. And they were able to regain a lot of the, the function, the ejection fraction improving and they were able to, instead of tired, fatigued, to not be able to do a lot of things, to go on, you know, doing, you know, very strenuous things and, you know, f- go full swing at life. Um, um, you know, running <laughs> on treadmills and, you know, seeing objectively how much their heart capacity has improved. Um, you know, I've treated autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and psoriasis. And, you know, beautiful results, you know, like this one lady with lupus, she, after three treatments, she went back to the doctor and her lupus markers were completely normal. So basically she was lupus free, Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, similar, you know, a lady that couldn't work, her hands were swollen. And in the middle of an IV infusion, she did this, she closed her hand and she started crying. So this is a surgical tech uh, that had worked for 30 years and, and she's incapacitated by, by rheumatoid arthritis. She couldn't you know, work for two months and she started crying. And she said, I have not been able to close my fist for, for a month. And, um, and she went back to work, you know, she was ecstatic. So um, what else? Um, I've treated people, um, interesting cases, you know, like this um, guy with t- testicular swelling and repeated infection. He already got one testicle taken out because of repeated swelling, nodules, and infection, rounds of antibiotics. So the urologist said, let's just take it out. So now the second testicle is having the same problem. And he was battling with it for, you know, two, you know, two, three years. So he, he came to me, I remember he was communicating with me saying, doctor, can this help with my testicle problem? 
So I always go with research. You know, I never promise people anything uh, unless I have some kind of research back. I mean, never promise anything, but I'll be a little bit more confident when there's some research backup. But with him, I said, I really don't know because no one has done research on this, but it can't hurt you. At least it can rejuvenate you. It can help you. There's a lot of anti-aging benefits that research has shown. So it's not going to hurt you. Let's see what it can do. And within a few months, I think it was two months, all the nodules disappeared. There's several marble-sized nodules. They disappeared. The testicle went back to normal. So I saved his testicle. That's his last remaining testicle, right? So it was beautiful. Another case, I um, have a gentleman in his 40s that is avid runner, uh, triathlete, but he got a plantar plate ligament tear. So on the bottom of his foot, uh, he got a ligament tear that's very painful. And that's devastating because that's part of what drives him in life is to be able to do, you know, to run and, and uh, participate in races. Um, two podi- podiatrists said, absolutely, you need uh, surgery. Um, and he was afraid to do it because he was afraid of the long recovery time. And also the possibility is going to change the shape of the foot. You know, of course, there's always potential for for some adverse events in surgery. So he wanted to try stem cells. It's minimally invasive invasive, and there's no downtime, right? So the bottom of the foot, the injection is going to be very painful. And I didn't think it was necessary that we inject right into the spot. So what I did was I give him the IV treatment and give him um, a little ultrasound machine to, to agitate the local area to attract more cells. And uh, within, and I told him to stay off running, stop, stop, you know, uh, you know, damaging that area because when the tissue is trying to heal, you don't want to repeatedly disrupt it. So he was good. He stayed off it for over six weeks. And then he was able to run, you know, at, at, at his full glory. And then, uh, and then within, I think a month or two after that, he participated in the Ironman race. I mean, this is, I mean, these are just, you know, dramatic and beautiful and, um, yeah. And so, so these are a few cases, you know, I treated autism and, you know, kids and, you know, I've seen kids being more communicative, um, become more, have more control over their bowel movements, um, be more socially interactive, less disruptive. Um, so yeah, you know, being able to speak words, I mean, that's, those are really big milestones, you know, for these kids. And uh, for even for neurodegenerative conditions, you know, like most, multiple sclerosis, I've seen, you know, great results from not being able to work to getting back to work. An ALS patient, you know, not being able to, you know, had to be on liquid, but after treatment was able to, you know, eat normal food again, you know, eat beef, you know, can chew and swallow and, you know, gaining functions, uh, dementia patients, gaining more cock you know, cognition, more personality back, um, and a lot of muscular skeletal repairs. So a lot of knee, hips, shoulders, um, back issues. And, um, and what else, you know, what, what other kind of fun stuff, you know, are there? Um, oh, a, a lady, she had trouble with uh, pregnancy and then she got stem cell treatment and within a few weeks, three to four weeks, she found out she was pregnant. It was, um, you know, she was pretty certain that it was because of stem cells because she had um, multiple, multiple um, attempts and they, the baby all had miscarriage, miscarriages. And now she's, she's at five, five months. They were always aborted within a few weeks, you know, two, three weeks. So now she's, you know, she's ecstatic. So these are the things that keep me going because, you know, I see that I'm, I'm really changing people's lives when sometimes I say I have no business in treating COPD or heart failure or liver cirrhosis. I'm out of, you know, I'm not trained in any of these specialties yet. I'm giving something that's so simple, but within that simple agent that I'm putting in the body, it contains all the drugs you ever need. And that's what's, what's so inspiring and so fun. You know, as a doctor, we went into this field to feel that we have agency. We have the capability to make a difference, right? You're sick. You come to me. I can give you something. 
and then there you're better. I mean, how wonderful it is. But I think so many doctors now are operating in this state of powerlessness. And I think that's one reason is there's such burnout, you know, besides what insurance are doing to doctors and just, and the entire medical model, right? It's not prevention and it's not fundamentally uh, getting people better. So you're just making people hanging on. They're, they're hanging on to life. So, um, you know, unfortunately, doctors, a lot of doctors are so stuck in their brain. That's how they were educated. That's how they continue to be trained. And they don't want to know. They, they, they don't have, maybe they don't have the intellectual curiosity or they don't have the time. Um, they don't have to drive to, to know more. So I've seen so many doctors who know so little, yet they would advise patients who are desperate, who are trying to get something, you know, to enhance their health and they talk them out of it. They said, oh, there's really no evidence. And I always tell this patient, I said, I'm happy to send your doctor evidence. What evidence would he like? Because I have over 300 articles here, you know, just in this little library, which condition would he like to know? I'll send him research from around the world. So, so that's the problem currently, you know, a, a lot of patients still, you know, of course they are bonded with their doctors. They believe what the doctors say, the doctors sound knowledgeable, just because they're knowledgeable in one area doesn't mean they have the full intellectual capability or curiosity to, to really understand what is actually available and how things have moved along. So I want people to be a little bit more skeptical you know, and not give the God status to doctors and be your own steward, a steward and really, you know, steer your own shape, a ship and do your own investigation and read articles. You know, if doctor is not reading, you read it. Um, so don't just don't, don't just trust doctors who are not well educated in this particular new field. That's just wonderful. I think with that, we can bring this beautiful session to a close. I think you fundamentally laid out the, the, the soil and the climate for where medicine is moving, where human healing is moving towards, and to give at us regular people agency and to take the power back into our own hands of what being healthy, what being whole means. And when we do get sick, to be able to have the curiosity and the inquisitive nature to seek out other kinds of modalities and therapies like what you're bringing to the world and hopefully we'll move into a sector of medicine that is actually going to inspire others to live longer and live better. Thank you so much, Dr. Joy Kong, for joining me today. I can't wait for us to speak again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for helping to spread the message. <laughs>